So the second module is a bit more technical, as I say, and it's about an overview on the cognitive radio technical topics. <clears throat> what we will see, first of all, we will talk about spectrum sensing and analysis, about learning methodologies for cognitive radio, a bit of an overview about dynamic spectrum access, and some I would like to leave you with some open issues, some questions that you guys would need to answer sooner or later. So, spectrum sensing. As I said, spectrum sensing is universally recognized as the main enabler for cognitive radio. Why? Because it doesn't matter if you are using it to access the spectrum as Mittala or hiking or the opportunistic way, but it is still a way for being aware of the environment. So that is absolutely needed. And it gives an indication on this availability of spectrum walls, if there is or there is any, but it can also give you an indication on about who is occupying the channel. Because so far we said the channel is free or not, binary decision, toss a coin. But what is more important in modern technologies is understanding who is occupying the channel. Because this gives us an idea about the signal that is occupying the channel. Not only, last but not least, as we said, CQI, CSI is fundamental for having proper adaptive modulation encoding scheme, meaning maximizing the efficiency of the transmission. So all of this goes under the umbrella of spectrum sensing. That's the name, the label, but everyone sticks on it. But it can be splitted because there are several <coughs> subtopics and each one of them is addressed in different ways. Personally, again, that's my vision. I see three main branches. The first one is the RF sensing. And that is basically taking the electromagnetic wave into the digital domain. That's already a huge problem. And then once you have the digital signal, you need to analyze it. You need to extract the main characteristics out of it. And once you extract, you process the signal, you can, what I call, classify the situation. That's the proper indication of the environmental awareness. So let's try to give a look of, of, about on all of them. Just a tiny bit. I just scratched the surfaces of the world. There is way more in literature. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to do it. I have sensing. That's the body of the cognitive radio. As we said before, digitalization of the signal, filtering, but also low noise amplifier. The same guys here can, can probably again confirm that having amplifiers in an extremely wide band in a linear part, that's a bit difficult. So what we do today if we want a wide, an extremely wide band, we split it into, I don't know how many transceivers, but <laughs> that's what is done. Because we cannot ensure on all the bandwidth the linearity of the components. Unless we, we would like to work and process something which has been non-linearly distorted, no thanks, uh, that's what we have to deal with. And that is the gap that we still have between what we call software-defined radio 
and fully software radio. In fully software radio, the ideal is that I take the widest bandwidth possible, I digitalize it immediately with no processing, just with a minimal, you know, RF filtering around the, after the antenna, and then everything done via software in digital domain. Is it possible? No. Will it be possible tomorrow? No, again. Maybe if the guys here from DPS are working hard enough, we can have it soon, but I have some doubt that even with their effort and smartness, we will be able to arrive at that limits because they are really physical limits that we can, we can do anything about. Uh, when I talk about digitalization, usually the digital domain is post FFT. So I take the samples in time domain, I do the FFT, and then I process everything in the spectrum domain. IFFT, sorry. Here I, I consider both sides, FFT and IFFT. Uh, about this type of sensing, the RF sensing, it is becoming extremely popular, a technique which is called compressed sensing. Because if we want to have the widest band possible, we need to do something about it. And compressed sens sensing could help. But what is compressed sensing? So in order to overcome this limitation, what we do is we take a very wide band. This very wide band, we assume, is sparsely occupied occupied, sorry, sparsely occupied, and then we undersample under the Nyquist level, under the Nyquist, fre under the Nyquist frequency. Normally you would say you will have a version of the signal which is bad. Yeah, sure, that's how it is. But, there is a but. There is a, I was mentioning a paper from Janakis uh, about compressed sensing. It's a very, very nice overview. And how it can be used with distorted information. Which is very, very bad quality, incomplete. First of all, from a mathematical point of view, we can perfectly reconstruct the signal. Mathematics say that we have an undersampled signal, we can reconstruct it as nothing was happened. Mathematically, again. And in the case of sparse spectrum, another thing that it's possible to do is using this lower quality version of the signals in order to identify where there is an occupation, and going just in that narrow, let's call it narrow, in reality it's called broadband, but in a reduced bandwidth set, and analyze it more in detail, so to have a complete representation of the signal instead. This helps in this multi-stage to avoid doing full bandwidth scanning, because if the spectrum is really sparse and the bandwidth is really large, it takes a lot of time. But if you undersample, get information of where the signals in the spectrum are, and analyze just those bandwidth, your scanning process is way faster. So the last way of using it is taking this incomplete information as it is and Use it as it is for analysis and classification. That's another choice. Up to you when you design the system to decide what to do and which is your need. All these choices are perfectly reasonable. 